Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams, and it's Friday, so that means it's time for another Gross Path Challenge. And today's challenge is number 19, coming to us from a test from the 2015 Descriptive Vet Path course given in Saskatchewan, Canada in 2015. And as I do at the beginning of all of my lectures and these Gross Path Challenges, I want to thank those people who provided me their images either directly or through online collections over the years, which allow me to put these challenges together. Let's go ahead and start it out your pens, your pieces of paper. Give yourself 60 to 90 seconds for each question. Don't forget to pause and then come back in when you're ready to hear the answer. Okay, slide number one is tissue from a cat. I would like for you to give me the morphologic diagnosis and the cause. Okay, time's up. This one appears to be upside down, but I read the number, so I had to flip it over. So this is the way it was taken. And we're looking at the inside of the rib cage on the pleura, and there is subpleural mineralization of the intercostal muscles. So that makes for a very good morphologic diagnosis. And the cause is chronic renal failure. A lot of things happen in chronic renal failure. You can have a range of, of lesions resulting from vasculitis as a result of increased circulating urea nitrogen, or you can have dystrophic mineralization of a number of tissues as a result of imbalance between calcium and phosphorus. Usually in chronic renal failure, the phosphorus gets very high, the calcium compensatorily will fall, but as the kidney fails totally, even that calcium is going to creep up. And when the number of your calcium is multiplied by the number of your phosphorus and exceeds 70, we start to see dystrophic calcification in a number of tissues. And the intercostal musculature, starting from the front of the animal, backwards is where it is often seen first. Some people call this uremic frosting. That's a nice name for it, but it's a pretty common lesion in dogs and cats in chronic renal failure with excessive levels of phosphorus and calcium. You can also see lesions of mineralization, a wide range of organs, including the kidneys, where you'll have mineralization of uh, Bowman's capsule and vascular basement membranes. You'll see it in the mid-zonal stripe of the gastric mucosa. And you'll also see it in where uh, an area where it just doesn't take much damage to totally destroy an organ, and that is mineralization of the vessels within the alveolar septa. Okay, ready for number two? This one is tissue from a calf. How about a morphologic diagnosis? Okay, time's up. Shouldn't take too long for this. I just asked you for a morphologic diagnosis. And this is the abomasum of a calf. And there is multifocal fibrinonecrotic abomasitis with ulcers. I don't know the exact cause of this particular lesion. Could be a number of things. Could be simple stress, started it off. Um, could be perhaps that the animal is getting a high dose of nonsteroidals. Much more common in, uh, in foals and calves, but any nonsteroidal overdose could probably do that. Um, could be a number of other things. It could even be the result of perhaps uh, uh, ruminal drinking um, and lactic acidosis, which in a young calf... Um, can result in the same range of lesions that we see in older animals, including down the road, you can see bacterial and fungal infection of the mucosa of any of the uh, gastric compartments. So but I'm simply looking for that morphologic diagnosis. And if you said it's multifocal fibrinocrotic abomasitis or necrotizing abomasitis, I'm going to give you full credit. Those are some easy points. But it gets tougher on the next one. I hope you know some of your exotic animals because slide number three is a woodchuck. And a woodchuck is what we call up in the northeast um, something that might be called in other parts of the world a marmot or a groundhog. So they're large uh, burrowing rodents. And I would like to get a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. 
on this tissue from a woodchuck slash marmot slash groundhog. Okay, time's up. Even though you might not never have seen a, uh, a woodchuck or a groundhog, hopefully that you recognize this as liver. Here's the gallbladder peeking out. And woodchucks have a very particular condition that's caused by a virus. And this is a hepatocellular carcinoma. You can call it hepatocellular adenocarcinoma if you want. Um, and this is part of a viral condition, which is caused by a hepatinovirus in, uh, in woodchucks. And hepatinoviruses are diseases that result in apoptosis and ultimately may cause uh, hepatocellular neoplasia in a number of rodent species, including uh, woodchucks and some forms of, of ground squirrels. There's also a duck hepatinovirus as well. And it's a classic disease of woodchucks. So whenever you hear the term woodchuck, I want you to think of this. It is an animal model for uh, human viral-induced inflammation and neoplasia. And they're used to study the effects of uh, hepatitis B and I believe hepatitis C in humans. Okay, enough with the woodchucks. Let's move on to slide number four. And this is tissue from a cat. I would like morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. Tricky Dr. Williams put two uremia slides almost back to back on this case. This is multifocal mineralization of the mesenteric arteries. And whenever you see mineralization of vessels in a cat, you need to think about that dystrophic mineralization due to uremia. Um, the other thing that, uh, you know, a couple of things may want to run through your mind. If this was a dog, you might want to think about atherosclerosis, but cats are not very prone to atherosclerosis, either due to diabetes or hypothyroidism, which is not really a cat disease uh, too much. So, um, but I think that it's worth running through your mind, but it's uremia again. Okay, slide number five. Great case from Federico Giannini. And this is tissue from a goat. I would like for you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. You could have gone a couple different ways on this one. Um, the morphologic diagnosis is a diffuse, chronic, and fibrinous lymphocytic synovitis. So it is chronic. There are some very chronic changes, a lot of fibrous connective tissue. There is this coating of fibrin, which is a little bit odd. But I'm going to take a wide range of causes on this one. Some of you might have said, well, I see the fibrin, and I'm going to think that it is uh, a, a chronic uh, omphalophlebitis, and that this was due to a gram-negative organism, something like E. coli or salmonella. I'm going to give you credit for that one. Some of you might have gone another way and said, well, it's a goat, and this is synovium, and one of the classic lesions associated with a lentiviral infection in sheep and goats is arthritis, especially in the older ones. Younger animals tend to get the encephalitic lesions if they're two to four months of age, but I'm going to go with uh, hygromas, bilateral hygromas due to CAE virus, and I'm going to give you full credit for that one. But the real answer to this one, and probably the most difficult most people don't think about, is that this synovitis is due to Mycoplasma capricolum. This is a species that is, that is seen in goats, sometimes in sheep and rarely in cattle. And in goats, it can cause a chronic synovitis like most other mycoplasma. Mycoplasma loves the joints. But the disease that mycoplasma capricolum is primarily known for is contagious caprine pleuronomonia, a lot like contagious bovine pleuronomonia, and a potential cause of, of widespread severe pneumonia and economic loss in people who raise large numbers of goats. So could have gone a number of ways. Certainly you want to know at least two, if not three, of those potential differential diagnoses. And you pretty well covered the uh, diseases causing synovitis 
in quotes. Okay, after this one, hopefully we are ready for something that's a little more straight, a little more straightforward. And oh, we have a cute puppy here, and I need you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and a cause for this lesion. Okay, the answer is slide number six, morphologic diagnosis. This is a, a condition that when I was in practice, we called it blue eye, and that's a great name for it. Um, the blue here is due to diffuse corneal edema. And the cause is a type 3 hypersensitive reaction following infection with canine adenovirus type 1 or vaccination. And because canine adenovirus type 1 causes damage to the endothelium, you're going to have an anterior uveitis. And it's also going to cause damage to the corneal endothelium, leakage of aqueous humor into the cornea. Cornea normally doesn't have any vas vessels, so that's the only way that the edema is going to get in there. And you're going to get a diffuse blue coloration because of the corneal edema. You can't see the anterior uv uveitis going on. This generally uh, goes away. And I saw a couple cases as a result of true adenovirus infection. The vast majority were due to the vaccines that we used 30 years ago, which modified live vaccines and would cause this reaction just like clockwork uh, three weeks after uh, inoculation. So blue eye, infectious canine hepatitis, canine adenovirus type 1, don't say type 2, and uh, corneal edema. Don't see this anymore, I guess, because we're using uh, component vaccines and we're vaccinating for uh, canine adenovirus 1 with canine adenovirus virus type 2. So not that common, but just a great and a classic lesion. Okay. Slide number 7 is tissue from a chicken. Need a morphologic diagnosis, and it's differential diagnosis time. So give me three possible diagnoses, or excuse me, not diagnoses, causes for this lesion. So one morphologic diagnosis, three causes. Okay, time is up. This is hepatic lymphoma. In chickens, you can see lymphoma cause a diffusely enlarged spleen, or spleen liver, or uh, hepatomegaly. Or you can see these white nodules, which you know, hopefully everybody's going to pick out as lymphoma. And three potential causes are three different viruses, which cause neoplastic transformation of lymphocytes. One is gallant herpes virus type 2, the cause of agent for Marek's disease. The second one is avian retrovirus, which is a, a also known as leukosis virus, which causes a disease known as lymphoid leukosis, and the third is avian reticuloendothelial virus. All of these will cause uh, transformation. Merrick's disease loves to pick on T-cells, leukosis likes to pick on B-cells, and reticuloendotheliosis really doesn't care which one it does, T or B. They will be often mixed. Histologically, you really can't tell the difference. Um, Dr. Cindy Bell, who is a great poultry pathologist, also being a tooth pathologist. That's an odd combination in my experience. Um, she gave me a, a really nice clue a number of years ago. And she said, when you're looking at the slides, if the lymphocytes are all beat up and they're really necrotic or apoptotic looking, you're probably dealing with Marex. And, and in the few cases that uh, people check for, because in our area of the country, we get our diagnostics from the, the Frederick uh, Diagnostic Lab. Most people don't go for uh, uh, the advanced diagnostics because it's a lot easier to buy another chicken. Um, but that tends to have been borne out in the cases where we've had the follow-up. So I don't know if that's a hard and fast rule, but um, basically it's going to be hepatic lymphoma and you have three possibilities. Particular endotheliosis is not a very common virus, so uh, but it's going to be either leukosis or Merix, and I think I've long stopped trying to guess at them either on gross or histology. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. Okay, we got three more. Slide number eight is from a ferret, 
and I need a morphologic diagnosis. Okay, time's up. A ferret is not a cat, nor is it a dog, but in this case, if you thought it might be a cat, you'd probably be good. And there is a large anterior mediastinal mass. Ferrets don't get lymphomas. They're very rare. I'm not going to say they don't ever, because I've seen a couple, but they sure do get a lot of lymphoma. And it falls into a couple different categories, and you have juvenile lymphomas, which tend to affect the viscera, including the thymus, the liver, and the spleen. So these animals come in, they can't breathe, and they have a huge liver and a huge spleen. It's an easy diagnosis to make. We don't see thymic lymphoma much in cats because it's one of the uh, forms of lymphoma that's pretty well controlled um, when you vaccinate cats for feline leukemia. So we don't see that much anymore, but we sure do see it in ferrets. So this was a young ferret. It's thymic lymphoma until proven otherwise. Slide number nine is from a rabbit. I want you to give me a morphologic diagnosis and the cause of this disease. Okay, time's up. Boy, Dr. Williams broke all the rules. We've had a lot of livers on this case. We've had two, two uremias. Uh, and we had just had lymphomas back to back. Well, it's another liver here. And uh, this is a classic disease of rabbits. If you didn't get liver, I can sort of get that because it's a fixed specimen. But it's a classic disease of a liver of the rabbits. And the structures that we're seeing with the granularity are massively enlarged and proliferative bile ducts. The morphologic diagnosis is something that you don't want to really walk into a test situation and try and figure it out for the first time. But this is a, a classic and common disease of young rabbits, especially around the age of weaning. They tend to develop uh, uh, immunity after that. So we don't see it much in older animals. But uh, the morphologic diagnosis that I'm looking for is a multifocal coalescing, proliferative and lymphoplasmacytic cholangitis. That's a mouthful. The cause is I marry a It is a a AP complexin coccidian that lives within the epithelium lining the bile ducts. And it causes not only proliferation of that, but there's a lot of fibrosis going on, and there's a lot of uh, lymphoplasmacytic or lymphohistiocytic inflammation as well. So I tend to lump the first two under proliferative, and I'll throw in the uh, inflammatory modifier lymphoplasmacytic. Um, this is a condition that goes through a number of stages, ultimately may result uh, in animals dying of hepatic failure. Look at the encroachment on the rest of the liver by these massively dilated ducts. Okay, classic disease. You will, If you see the, the intact liver, you will be able to trace out all the bile ducts because there'll be these big white pipes which are raising from the surface of the liver in advanced cases like that. Okay. This last slide is from a cat. How about a morphologic diagnosis? Look carefully at this particular lesion. Okay, this is a tough one. I wish I could, uh, I really wish I could give you an easy one. So you start your weekend and say, oh, that was great. Um, but this is from a cat and a morphologic diagnosis. Right here we have stricture of the small intestine. The intestine, okay. This is a proximal intestine. Food, 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 full of food, food, folds over right here. Food, 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 and all of a sudden becomes somewhat white and there is a stricture. This is an intestinal carcinoma. Intestinal, so the proximal is full of food and it's strictured down and no food could get out into the rest of the intestine. Not that uncommon in older cats. And the second morphologic diagnosis, if you are looking, we have this area of hemorrhage and all these little beads because that neoplasm has broken out into the mesentery and has caused mesenteric carcinomatosis. So these are the fun ones. You know, everybody knows black leg and things like that and BVD. These are the ones you sort of have to noodle through, and they're a lot of fun. 
and intestinal adenocarcinomatosis because it's an epithelial neoplasm that invades deeply, it's going to cause an intense desmoplastic or scarous response. And eventually that fibrous connective tissue is going to scar down and it's going to cause that stricture. Lymphoma, which is even more common in the intestine, we still see a lot of, um, doesn't cause that. There is no desmoplastic response. The round cells, the neoplastic lymphocytes don't incite any mesenchymal response. So they won't, they won't scar down. They actually have a worse prognosis because everything leaks right through the mucosa. Um, if you could get to this one very early uh, and you can resect it, it has a much better prognosis, but obviously that's not going to happen once it is spread out until the mesenteric surface. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of the Gross Path Challenge. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're not mad at me for being so tricky with, with all the uremias and lymphomas and the livers. Um, but always expect the unexpected. But I expect everyone's going to have a great weekend, and I hope you do. And uh, we'll see you back with another Gross Path Challenge next Friday. Everybody have a great day.